All right. Thank you so much, Emily. Yeah, so I got uh, my photo prop here of that era when the baritone horn was about the size of me. Uh, it's one of my favorite pictures. Just uh, <laughs> good stuff. And uh, yeah, so uh, welcome, everyone. Happy PancakesCon. Uh, I was actually a PancakesCon 3 backup speaker, and I'm just so thankful that PancakesCon staff has invited me on to give the talk this year. I'm so excited. It's been a year in the making. Uh, I updated the slides. I think I got everything more 2023 friendly. If there's some older stuff, apologies in advance. But I'm here to talk about GCP, also known as Google Cloud Platform, building a cyber range to learn a whole bunch of stuff there, and uh, the magic of 10-meter ham radio. And I'm sure many of you think, oh, ham radio, like, I've seen that before. You know, you go to DEF CON Ham Radio Village, you go to your local hacker con, and you see everyone with these little HT radios. And those are fine and dandy. Those are super fun. That's how many people get started in ham radio. But I'm actually not going to talk about that today. I'm going to talk about 10-meter ham radio, like uh, this old radio. It's about as old as I am. It's about the size of a car stereo, and that's what you'll need to send these really big radio waves that bounce off the ionosphere. Super excited to talk about that. Uh, I'll be talking about the GCP stuff first and switching over to ham radio. Uh, plenty of opportunities for questions along the way. Please get those in the Slack. I'll try to leave some time to answer them live at the end. If I don't, I'll make sure to get back to those by the end of the con. Uh, again, the topics are separate, but there is a recurring theme here. It's that inclusive, inclusivity is awesome, and so is accessibility. Trying to make both of these things, uh, having a cyber range and ham radio, affordable and something that everyone can do, regardless of who you might know in cybersecurity or radios or how much money you might have. Uh, this stuff has never been more accessible, and uh, I try to do everything I can to improve upon that. Oh, uh, one more housekeeping thing. So all the slides will be up at GitHub, the link's there. Uh, a lot of this is based off of my blog at kd9cpb.com. I'm the only kd9cpb out there that's actually my ham radio license. So I'm pretty easy to find on InfoSec Exchange. And in the event that my website uh, gets denial of service or if I stop paying the bill, whatever, you'll still find most of the content up on that GitHub folder, save this PDFs. Okay, so a little bit about, you know, who's this dude and, and what's a cyber range. So uh, I've been doing network security for quite some time now. I got super lucky that a really good family friend of mine was able to successfully lobby both my parents and uh, help me convince them to go to DEF CON as a teenager, uh, which was just a crazy experience because that was in the mid 2000s back when wireless security it was just kind of starting to get get on the global stage. You know, people didn't have smartphones back then. It was just a completely wild west era where everyone was doing WEP encryption, just all the war driving stuff that was happening. It just blew my mind. I was fascinated by it. And back then, Backtrack Linux, the predecessor to Kali, it was like just released. And that, that really just got me uh, very interested in the network security field pretty early on. And throughout my career, I've done a whole bunch of different stuff, but I always seem to bounce back to some flavor of network engineering or network security role, uh, mostly the blue team side of things, uh, blue team for the win. And my day job, my goal is to make sure that all the firewalls and network security policies and things uh, don't result in turning into a ladder like you see on the meme in the slide. Uh, one thing I should do is uh, this boring but necessary, uh, the views and opinions in this presentation are strictly those of my own, not necessarily those of any organization I've worked with in the past or currently worked for. That's real important. I'm just here as Tom today. <laughs> And um, one other big thing here is the cyber, secure, cy cyber range can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I'm gonna go with this definition. It's like the top Google result. It's kind of a mouthful and I can't stand when people just read directly off a PowerPoint slide. But I'm gonna do that because this sentence is just too fun not to. So here we go. A cyber range is a controlled interactive technology environment where an up and coming cybersecurity professional can learn how to detect and mitigate cyber attacks using the same equipment they will have on the job. Whew, that's a lot of words right there. And that sounds pretty expensive, right? Like at your day job, it's like, oh my gosh, I have to just spend a ton of money with a consultant to do that type of thing. Or if I'm a student, maybe like, oh, that's like a super high tuition thing that I might not be able to afford. Uh, well, not so much. So nowadays, with the magic of Google Cloud Platform and the $300 free credit that they give just about anyone with a Gmail address and a credit card, you can build a really nifty cyber range and learn a whole ton of stuff uh, just with using resources that are freely available. So that's what I'm going to spend the most time talking about today, mostly from a blue team network security perspective. 
But even if you're not into blue teaming, if you're red team, purple team, anything in between, I'll try to keep this as general as possible so everyone walks away with some good Google Cloud stuff at the end of the day. Oh, and I'm talking about Google Cloud just because that's the one that is really most popular with uh, my network simulation, uh, well, let's call it a tool of choice. It's called EVNG. It's like a hypervisor. Uh, there's a couple others out there, mainly GNS3 and Container Lab that are similar. But Google Cloud was kind of uh, adopted very early by the EVNG community, building these cyber ranges and these network topologies, uh, simulators and things, because they allow nested virtualization. So kind of like that VM inception where you have like a VM inside of a VM, there's a lot of reasons why you'd want to do that when you're building a cyber range, really any type of network simulator nowadays. And so that's why I've kind of stuck with Google Cloud because there's really good guides, really good documentation on how to do that nested virtualization. You can totally do all this stuff on other cloud platforms. It doesn't have to be Google. Now, I, I didn't really start off doing things in Google Cloud. So I've always had some level of, we'll call it a home lab with, with mostly Cisco gear. Like I did all my Cisco certifications early on. And back then, in like the late 2000s, you kind of needed to have like gear that you either bought off eBay or using a subpar simulator. Like uh, at the time, uh, it's gotten a lot better over the years, but tools like Cisco Packet Tracer to try to, you know, get the hands on and really learn the concepts so that you can pass those certification tests and, you know, go forward in a career in network security and stuff. But I'm not going to be talking about any of that today. You're not going to be going off and buying things on eBay to build a cyber range. It's just one... Uh, not really sustainable anymore. It's just this technology has gotten so complicated that the stuff from a couple of years ago or a decade ago it isn't always as applicable to what you're doing nowadays and you know today's latest and greatest, all the cloud fueled things that are going on. And the other big thing too is I would always like build out like a small section or a small lab for like one particular thing. Uh, back then, I would never really build up like, you know, a full blown environment with like different servers and different switches and firewalls. Like it was just one cost prohibitive and two, uh, the virtualization technology to do that on your own wasn't quite there. But the times have changed. It's actually very easy to do all of this in a virtualized environment. And uh, why not do that on a, a Google Cloud Platform type uh, system? So I first started doing a lot of this sort of thing in the summer of 2020. I changed jobs and I knew that my new gig was going to involve a lot of work with network authentication servers. Uh, some of these like Aruba ClearPass, Cisco ICE, Portnox, FreeRadius is also popular. Uh, some of these are pretty beefy machines to run. You're talking about virtual machines that are like 32 gigs of RAM just to get the ball rolling on them. And I really wanted to play with this stuff at home, but I didn't have 32 gigs of RAM. So I asked a friend about it and he's like, oh, try Google Cloud Platform. For like 50 cents an hour, you can rent out a virtual machine that gives you like 64 gigs of RAM, like 16 processor cores. Uh, you know, you're talking about running Cisco Ice on your own, like over here. Let's try running that in EVNG on Google Cloud, see what happens. And I did, and I just got hooked right away. Again, you get that $300 new customer credit if you've never used Google Cloud Platform before. And so if you're spending about 55 cents an hour on just getting this virtual machine up, you know, you can really make that $300 go a long way. And of course, there's tons of asterisks, you know, there's all of these hidden fees and things, but in the grand scheme of things, you can really, really move the needle on knowledge and not only the network security part of the world, building these cyber ranges in Google Cloud, but actually learning about how uh, something like a virtual private cloud works on a platform like Google. If you learn that, it's pretty similar to what you'd see in, in Azure or AWS. And there's just all types of lessons learned that you can do from doing this at home. So what I did is I already had a Cisco firewall and an Aruba managed switch that I bought off eBay, just chilling at home. So I built a tunnel between that firewall and my old condo and Google Cloud. And that was really cool because now I could start having all of these different clients that I had in my condo or I'd have like an older Linux machine, an older Mac machine, a new fully patched Windows machine. And with these authentication servers that I was playing with, you can do all of these fancy things like test out, you know, a, a wired guest captive portal or try to do like the bring your own device thing where in order to access the network, the machine has to be fully patched. And you can do all sorts of really, really cool stuff using that tunnel between wherever you're located and the cloud. I just thought that was so much fun for me. But I wouldn't expect most people to go out and have like an enterprise firewall off eBay just chilling in their second bedroom. That's just not something that you'd see. So uh, I, I started blogging about this sort of thing and ended up redoing it like this 
where I did it with free-ish stuff only. And what I mean by free-ish stuff is just virtual machines and software images that you can download from all these vendors you see here but with only having an email address and you don't need like an expensive service contract. You don't need to like know anyone at the company, what like some of these vendors work. You can just go out and obtain all this stuff on your own. And there is just so much that you can learn setting up these cyber ranges, particularly on the EVNG Google Cloud Platform side uh, from any machine. Like I was running these virtual machines in this little corner here on a really old uh, desktop machine at home. But even if you just have something as simple as a Chromebook or an old machine uh, running Ubuntu or something, you can really move the needle on all your skill sets and network security or really uh, many different domains of cybersecurity by trying this at home. Highly recommend giving it a shot if you got that $300 Google Cloud Platform credit. Uh, one example here, kind of hitting some blue team, purple team, and red team concepts. So we got, let's say, an unpatched Log4j server that I built inside of my EVNG cyber range in Google Cloud Platform. Now this is inside, it's like a VM inside of a VM. You can do that. And as long as all the traffic is staying within your tunnel, uh, machines that you own, or I shouldn't say machines that you own, machines that you, know, you are actively responsible for, I can go ahead and maybe I have like, a, I prefer networksecuritytoolkit.org's uh, tool set for doing this, or it could be Kali, Linux, Parrot, whatever. And let's say I end up trying to pop this log4j vulnerability on the server that I have in my cyber range. And let's say I set up security onion. Maybe I have, I don't know, something like Wazoo and, and all types of different IDSs going to try to detect that nasty log4j traffic. Maybe I have an open sense VPN. Maybe I'm doing something with SSL decryption to try to, you know, get all my defense and depth set up so that this log4j server, although it's vulnerable, hopefully have enough defense and depth where some things would be in the way to stop it. And uh, let's say that you know everything goes well, you know, you're trying to get into this machine and it works, cool. Well, now I can look through all of the logs to figure out what went wrong. What could we do better? Obviously, patching log4j would, uh, would definitely be in that category. But you, know, you can learn all types of things from both blue team, red team, everything in between setting up this infrastructure. It takes a lot of time, but again, there's just so much that you can learn. Now, speaking of which, there's two different ways you can set up that tunnel between wherever you're at and Google Cloud Platform. You can take the blue pill and use more of a software-defined solution. Uh, I, I really like Zero Tier. You can get a free account. It's super cool. And there's other solutions based off of WireGuard and other tools to do this. But effectively, what you're doing is you install software on whatever your client machine is. You install the software on your EVNG cyber range, Google Cloud, and it just magically connects the two together. It's kind of set it and forget it. It's like a crock pot of network connectivity. Super fun and cool, but you're not really gonna learn like the fundamentals of you know how IPsec tunnels work. You're not gonna like get into the nitty gritty of virtual, um, uh, I shouldn't say virtual, the virtual private cloud side of Google, which is super fascinating in my opinion. So you can take the red pill and kind of build your own tunnel directly from the Google's IPsec capabilities with the VPN tunneling as if you were an enterprise going to, let's say, an OpenSense VPN, uh, you know, just an OpenSense VM running a basic firewall on any machine that's made within the past. Well, let's say uh, you can run OpenSense on anything that's uh, been produced within the past 15 years or so. It's just amazing what you can do without a whole lot of hardware and how accessible all of this stuff can be. And so uh, the two different options, as we just talked about, you can take that blue pill doing zero tier. There's a really good set of YouTube videos on setting all this up in EVNG. Uh, this, uh, Tony E, it's a little bit dated, but the things that didn't really uh, age well are very much accounted for in EVNG's community cookbook documentation. There's a lot of good stuff out there. There's also my blog. It's kind of funny saying that my blog is inferior to Tony's video, but um, if you want to take that red pill, this is the way to do it, doing all the fancy stuff in Google Cloud Platform. But again, it's messy. You learn a lot, but if you're not too into network security or like the network uh, side of life, uh, maybe avoid this and look at Tony's video instead. Now, I'm briefly going to step on my network engineering high horse and just say that is I really don't like this meme on the bottom. It's kind of mean. But I feel like it hits a point that, you know, in the past, it was all about firewalls and perimeter-based security and all this cool stuff that, you know, very mature uh, five-tuple firewall rules and things to keep places secure. 
And that's all fine and dandy, but nowadays, like you get all these zero trust things coming in, your secure access, secure edge, your cloud access security broker, like all of these like new, super fancy, awesome, amazing defense and depth tools. But I feel like if you don't know the basics of like an IPsec tunnel or five tuple firewall rules or the fundamentals of TCP IP, it can just be really hard to comprehend some of these, you know, fancy new toys. So I think there's still tons of value and doing something like an IPsec tunnel and firewall rules. And if you've never done that sort of thing before, and if you're interested in a blue team or even just a regular old information technology, net, network engineering or systems engineering background, again, there's just so much cool stuff that you can learn for almost nothing with these free images and that Google Cloud Platform $300 credit. Okay, so let's say you build all of this. Well, uh, everything's set up and working well. You know, you, you had your fun trying to pop that log4j server. Well, what do you do now? Well, what I would try to do if I was just getting started in, started in the field nowadays, one thing that's so hot right now is things like Ansible and Terraform and ways to do this in Python, where you can do infrastructure as code. Meaning, let's say you built this super cool cyber range. Everything is awesome. Well, now maybe I'll try to set up some Ansible playbooks to make everything easily reproducible. So if let's say, you know, I've set up, you know, three VMs like this, and I want six VMs with the same exact configuration with no human error, or no, you know, just clicking the buttons or running the same yum update commands over and over again, you can do all that with Ansible. And it's something I really love doing at my day job. And oh my gosh, this is just so hot right now. If you If you know how to mass deploy out, uh, let's say, firewall rule set with Ansible and do it in a way that doesn't break down a production environment. That is just like the coolest thing ever. And I just think there's a lot of awesome stuff you can do in that infrastructure as code field nowadays in your cyber range. Uh, a couple other links here that uh, I mentioned, uh, Ethan Banks, again, has all these different network vendors where you can get those images for free. So let's say uh, I ended up using like a Juniper SRX firewall or something in my cyber range. And uh, I decide, okay, I learned Juniper, maybe I'll try Fortinet today or Palo Alto. And some of those images, you'll have to either have a relationship with, uh, a sale, with the sales team of these security vendors, or if your day job has some type of service contract. But oftentimes, even if you're just a student, maybe your university might have some type of way to get you access to these images and you can learn all these different vendors. You know, there's so much good stuff in that field. Lastly, EvenG isn't the only game in town. That's what I used, but you can certainly use other tools like GNS3 to build your cyber range. There's this fancy new kit on the block called Container Lab. I really want to play with it more, but I got to be honest, my level of understanding of container networking and Docker, I'm not quite with the times. I think as soon as I fit better figure out container network security, I'll probably give that a shot. If you are familiar with containers and Docker, maybe just go straight to Container Lab. You might have more fun with that than EvenG. But again, whatever floats your boat, whatever sparks the most joy, it's your cyber range in Google Cloud with that $300 free credit. Uh, do whatever uh, sparks the most interest to you. Okay, so uh, I'm here in Chicago. I have a pretty bad Chicago accent. I'm not even going to try to do a British accent, but if I could, I would say, and now for something completely different, like in all the Monty Python skits, and make sure to type in those questions you might have about the GCP cyber range in the Slack, uh, preferably sooner while it's fresh in your mind. I'm hoping to have some time at the end to have plenty of live Q&A, but even if I go too far or if whatever the reason we can't do it, I'll try to get back to you in Slack today. If you can't, uh, again, I'm easy to find, KD9CPB, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have to the best of my ability. Okay, so the magic of 10 meters. Now, there's actually a different ham radio band called 6 meter, which is known as the magic band, but uh, 10 meter is a bit different here. And so what 10 meter is, is a 33 foot, this gigantic radio wave that will actually bounce off the ionosphere, like you see in this picture here, and what that allows you to do is you can have these crazy situations where you can go from like Chicago to Argentina, no problem, like two-way communication. Even if you might have not the best situation for your antenna or if you're in a condo or something, it's pretty wild what you can do with 10 meter nowadays. Uh, the solar weather decides what's going to bounce off the ionosphere and what doesn't. And the solar weather is really good for 10 meter right now. So perfect time for this for this chat. And you might notice uh, all this stuff where it says frequency is greater than uh, critical frequency, they just escape. So those escape out into outer space, and that's fine. And that's what these radios will do, all of your VHF and UHF radios. 
that's not going to bounce off the ionosphere for the most part. It's really cool because that will allow you to communicate with the International Space Station. There's a really awesome Pancakes Con 2 talk about that. Or maybe you'll communicate with aliens. You never know what's escaping the Earth. But uh, I'm not going to be talking about these at all today. We're going to focus on HF, these really big radio waves. And 10 meters is special to me because that's the only one that you can use with a basic technician license. Again, we want to make this as accessible as possible for ham radio. You don't need to spend like a whole ton of time studying for this technician license uh, with just a cheaper radio and the lowest level ham radio license. You can have a ton of fun. Uh, this picture to the left, uh, I don't like, or meme rather, I don't like it too much, but uh, we have kind of a recurring theme here that in the past, ham radio has had some big inclusivity problems. It's getting better, especially after the pandemic, but uh, it's not quite perfect yet. We'll go into that a little bit more, but it used to be that largely on what we call a phone mode of communicating with ham radios, where you're talking into a speaker and, you know, talking to a microphone, listening to a speaker, You'd hear a lot of uh, mostly retired guys talking about things that might not be the most pleasant topics, uh, medical ailments, uh, things that are disrespectful to women, et cetera. A lot of that's going away in favor of new systems like FT8. I'm a huge FT8 fan. We'll talk about that a ton. But uh, even if you've tried ham radio before and maybe you know you got on, on the air, and then uh, I remember this happened to me in 2014. It might have even been this radio, this cheap $30 thing. And I remember distinctly hearing a conversation on our local repeater. Oh, you know, these millennials are killing ham radio. They got these cheap radios. They're just the worst. No one knows Morse code. Like millennials, Gen Z, and they're just terrible. And it just really hurt me. Like, you know, I'm just trying to get into this hobby. And it, it gets very discouraging at times when you hear that type of thing. And I feel like it should be the exact opposite. Again, I do everything I can to make ham radio uh, as inclusive as possible. Cause I just think about, you know, when my daughter is this size, I'm really gonna push her into a ham radio license. <laughs> I know that I'm gonna be peer pressuring her. And I hope by the time that she does reach that age, a lot of the sexism and ageism that does happen on the radios has been quieted down. I think there's a lot of progress that we still need to make, but it is getting a lot better if you've tried this before and have experienced some of that nasty stuff. Oh, uh, one last thing here. So this link, I know it's long. Don't worry, the slides are on Git. Get, on get, ah, keep saying GitLab, GitHub. But um, this diagram, so or uh, drawing rather. So I first learned about HF when I was in the Marine Corps. And the guide that taught me all of that stuff about HF radio wave propagation, it's not in the public domain. I couldn't find it online. But fortunately, the Army has almost the same document that I stole this diagram from. So definitely check that out if you're interested in you know, what bounces off the ionosphere and what doesn't. OK, so let's say that you are interested in bouncing radio waves off the ionosphere. The first thing you need is a ham radio license. Uh, you'll need that to transmit pretty much anything on these radios. You don't need a license to receive anything. So if you just want to receive only, that's totally cool. But all the fun is in transmitting. We'll be focused on that. Next, you need to get a radio. I'll tell you what worked for me and uh, things that you might want to consider. And then WSJTX, this is the program that does that FT8 mode I talked about a little bit earlier. So FT8, it's like this spooky bagpipe magic noise, for lack of a better term. It, it sounds really creepy. It's, it truly sounds like a weird back, bagpipe, like it's kind of creepy. But so it sends 15 seconds of that weird bagpipe noise through your radio. And then you spend another 15 seconds or so having the radio receive the bagpipe noises from other people throughout the globe. And then this application will put all the bagpipe noise together and it'll decode it into simple text that you can see on your screen. So it's not like you have to like crank up the radio and like try to hear someone's voice or like some Morse code through a bunch of static if you have a weak signal. This just does all the weak signal detection and kind of decoding for you which is super awesome because you can use really cheap radios without a whole lot of power to get this stuff working. Whereas before you'd have to spend a whole ton of money and it's just uh, not as accessible as it is today with, thanks to FT8. And then lastly, QSL cards. So this is nothing more than just kind of like a, a greeting card that you send back and forth to someone that you had a, a ham radio contact with. Uh, I really like this because I'm not too sure about everyone on this call, but it seems like everything I get in the mail is either junk mail or bills and things. It's just really nice to get you know, a pleasant letter in the mail from someone that you had a ham radio conversation with and a little bit more about 
what their radio setup is. Uh, I find that very enjoyable because again, uh, having a little kid around, I feel like I'm on the radio very, very infrequently during the day. And then once she's asleep, I can go ahead and you know write these postcards, receive them back. It's super fun. It's a very asynchronous thing to do. Whereas normally uh, radio communication is very synchronous. Like you got to be kind of having the headphones on and you know in the zone when you're doing it. And I just don't have that luxury much anymore. Now, lastly, um, you don't need to transmit at all to have a whole ton of fun with radios. So another option is uh, these little SDR dongles. So this is a Raspberry Pi computer. This is, I think I got it for like 15 bucks or so. If you just search for RTL SDR, the brand doesn't really matter. Uh, I personally like the new elect ones the most, but with these things, you can receive all types of different radio waves. Uh, just recently, I was playing around where you can get, it's called ADSB. It's the like kind of radar-like functionality that's on almost all commercial airplanes nowadays. And you can just receive all of that and you know see what's in the sky without any internet access at all. It's a really cool STEM-related activity you can do. Again, I feel like the best thing about ham radio is it's just such a great, fun way to get people interested in technology. And you know, once you start learning about how things work at 28 megahertz, then you can start talking about what things look like at 2.4 gigahertz with Wi-Fi and you know, really get you know, kids and other people that might not have thought about technology in that way, very interested in all of our fields. Okay, so let's say you want to get a ham radio license. The first thing I would recommend doing is just search your local municipality and uh, the words ham radio volunteer examiner and the search engine of your choice. Uh, luckily here in Chicago, we have a whole bunch of awesome groups that will do will help you get the exam uh, proctor for you and they'll teach you. And it's all awesome stuff. But if you're somewhere far away or don't want to do that, that's cool too. There's plenty of online options and they're proctored. So it's kind of weird. Like they'll make you like, you know, use the webcam and stuff, but uh, hey, you can get your license that way. And then the most popular method I've noticed recently, uh, this is the one that I've used for my ham radio license. It's called hamstudy.org. And it allows you to memorize the question pool <laughs> of what you need to study to get your license. And I know that sounds like cheating and it kind of is. And it's weird because normally at work, like, if you basically study all the questions on, let's say, like a Cisco certification and you have zero, like, you know, real world skills to actually do Cisco networking, that's very much frowned upon. But in ham radio, as long as you know what not to do and you know not to transmit on the frequencies that you're not allowed to tra transmit on, you can really do a lot of uh, learning on the job or learning on the hobby, rather. And as long as you get that license, you know, learning from someone else that's done this before and, you know, it takes you under their wing and teaches you these things as you get the license, uh, that's cool, too. I know there's some, some ham radio operators that feel differently, but again, I feel like the more people with ham radio licenses, uh, the more awesome this hobby is for all. Speaking of which, again, recurring theme here, there's been some inclusivity problems with ham radio. Now, I'm not going to dive too deep into this, but... This picture here, this is of the January 2023 QST magazine, which is published by the American Radio Relay League. Uh, you'll notice that um, for many, many years, the to get into ham radio, you kind of had to know Morse code. You kind of had to have like the equivalent of thousands of dollars of equipment to do this sort of thing. And that resulted in people that either retired from telegraph companies or you know, think about like the Titanic, you know, people in the radio room where you did radios in the military or on a ship or something, and you had to know Morse code in order to get the license. So that resulted in a demographic that looks very similar to one that you see on the front of that magazine. Now, don't judge a book by its cover, though, because things are getting much better nowadays. Thanks to in the early 90s, many of the requirements to learn Morse code started to get waived, and that kind of culminated in the mid 2000s where for all the levels of ham radio licenses, from the super advanced ones to the most basic ones, you don't need to learn Morse code anymore. And for the vast majority of hams out there, this is an awesome thing because the more people that get their licenses, you know, the more people to talk to, the better, you know, more people, more inclusivity is awesome. But sadly, there is a small minority of ham radio operators that want to keep it an old boys club. And they'll say things like, Oh, if you don't know Morse code, you're not a real ham. Or again, going back to some of the things earlier, just things that are quite rude, a lot of jerks on the airwaves. But luckily, uh, a lot of that is kind of uh, dying off, for lack of a better term. 
And there's really, really, really cool ham radio channels out there, particularly uh, Rhea Jerem. She's got this book that she wrote that will teach you the fundamentals of radios, not just memorizing for the technician exam, but everything you know to like deep dive, understand it. So if you're going to buy a publication to learn this test, I would highly recommend hers. Again, the ARRL, they are making some positive changes, but uh, certainly there's a lot of people that are still quite behind the times. And until they fix that, uh, I would not recommend getting one of their publications today. But I truly hope that they change for the better. And uh, they're one of the biggest radio groups in the whole U.S., the whole world. Uh, it's kind of funny. There's this blog post there that uh, talks about some of that ham radio drama, pretty much uh, speaks my opinions to that matter. But uh, anyhow, that's enough about uh, ham radio drama for now. Let's talk a little bit more about the radios themselves. So we got a couple options here. The first is uh, my prop. This is a cheap 10-meter ham, ham radio. You can buy one for about 150 to 400 on eBay nowadays. And this is only going to get you on the 10 meter band. And this is cool because with that basic technician license, you can still do all this amazing stuff. But if you get a general license, you're probably going to want like a bigger, beefier radio that can use all of these different frequencies or, or um, bands rather uh, that aren't 10 meters. So like 20 meters and 40 meters, th those bands work better during certain times of the day. And you might have a lot more success finding people to talk to on those bands. So you might want to go with option two instead, where you buy a little more expensive radio, but it's more buy once, cry once, meaning that if let's say you do get your general exam, you spend, again, give or take maybe best case scenario about a week, worst case scenario about a month studying for that exam. You know, now you have access to all of these different radio frequencies that something like that G90 radio can access. Whereas with the 10 meter radio, you're just kind of stuck with that. And, you know, it's just going to pick up dust if you find a band that you like more. So buy one square once uh, isn't too bad. It kind of stinks having to spend more money up front, but you can take that red pill into ham radio if you so choose. Now WSJTX. So this is the application I really like that does the magical bagpipe noise. So you can get all of these um, magical bagpipe noises bouncing off the ionosphere. And uh, I ended up making this meme on Reddit. Uh, this picture is actually me doing WSJTX while cleaning my bathroom. And this picture is of Morse code and about how it doesn't spark joy. And so uh, when I posted it to Reddit, I got some really interesting feedback. I, I never thought about this before. And, and it was from this person that mentioned, you know, Tom, as much as I agree with you, and I'm glad that we're not gatekeeping ham radio between people that know you having no Morse code to get your license anymore. But I also feel that there's these programs like Parks on the Air where you go out into the woods and you set up a radio and let's say you're doing Morse code and you just kind of zone out. You're just in the woods, almost meditating, only focusing on the dit dot dits and everything coming through the radio and you just relax and you don't have any other thoughts in your mind other than the Morse code in nature. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's like very meditative. Like maybe I should try that someday. But uh, I'm not going to be learning Morse code anytime soon. I think if I spend time learning code, it should be improving my Python skills because trust me, those could use some improvements. But uh, just something to think about. Again, I'm not as anti-Morse code as I used to be. I used to say, oh, that's just gatekeeping the hobby. It's bad. We need to be more inclusive of everyone. And just some of the nasty things people would say about uh, ham radio operators like myself that got their license well after the Morse code requirements were removed. I think we're making some positive strides there. You don't need to learn it, but uh, there is some advantage to it nowadays. And uh, there's other programs like JS8 Call, where this one will allow you to do like an AOL instant messenger style, like two-way chat with someone. Uh, FT8 conversations are very sparse. We'll talk about that more next slide. But if you want to do any of these things, YouTube is your friend. Oh my gosh, there are so many ham radio YouTube channels that will deep dive into all these topics. You can learn tons of stuff for free over there. Now, this is WSJTX, and the way that this works is you'll see, and uh, this is the band activity, so everything I receive is to the left here, and we can see the CQ, so that's ham radio jargon for, hey, I'm looking to talk with someone, my call sign is N9PA, and I'm located in Grid Square EN61. It just so happens that Grid Square EN61 is Northeast Illinois, that's where I am as well, and so I saw this, I double clicked on it, and uh, 15 seconds later, it transmits into the radio, Hey, uh, you know, N9PA, this is K9CPB, I'm in the same grid square. And then that remote station says, oh, hey, cool, I received you. This is your signal level. And then I send, hey, Beck, oh, yeah, I received it too. This is your signal. 
And then I send an RR73, that's ham radio for, hey, cool, have a nice day, you know, peace out. And then, uh, or, sorry, he sent that to me, and then I sent that to him. And I know his name because you can look up all of these uh, call signs. There's a database. Uh, it's not the best for privacy, but it's also kind of cool because you can see just how far away uh, the person that you're talking with is. And there's these sites like QRZ that are kind of like ham radio MySpace almost. <laughs> where you can have a little profile about what radios you're using and anything at all ham radio related. Okay, so your 10 meter mileage will vary. So the solar weather deciding what's gonna bounce off the ionosphere is very favorable for 10 meters during the day nowadays, but it's not always going to be. And if you're doing this at night, you're going to want different bands that have different characteristics of how they bounce and propagate. But um, this screen, this is from 2020, and back then it was really easy for me to get from Chicago to South America. Nowadays, I, I can't do that as often anymore. I usually have better luck getting out to either California or Europe compared to places like Brazil or Argentina. But again, your mileage is going to vary. The stuff is not reliable. It's a hobby. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, this is a screenshot of when it didn't work, when the only station that was heard was, you know, in... in Northeast Illinois and not too far away. You're not bouncing off the ionosphere, but uh, again, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. That's why it's a hobby. It's all fun and games. And lastly, QSL cards. So th there's a couple different ways to do this, whether it's directly through mail or on some of these uh, ham radio MySpace, we'll call them websites like QRZ, Logbook of the World, and EQSL. But when you have these conversations, you want to log it in the logbook to say, oh yeah, you know, I communicate with this country. There's all these awards you can get if you like talk to people in a hundred different countries and and that's all cool. But this one story I want to share is uh, this was uh, almost two years or I guess 18 months ago where uh, I, I was doing the FT8 thing and I looked up the call sign on the site QRZ and it turns out that I communicated with someone in the country of Anguilla. And I'm embarrassed to say this, but I had no idea that the country of Anguilla existed. I couldn't point it out on a map. I never heard of it before. And so I was just fascinated. I was looking at the Wikipedia page about it and, you know, learning. I felt like I left that conversation a better person knowing about, you know, because the radio waves don't apply. Sorry, the radio waves don't respect international borders. There's just a whole world out there that you can access on 10 meter and it's super fun. So again, you can whether it's through the the postcard type things, through snail mail, or through some of these, uh, we'll keep calling them ham radio MySpaces. There's just a lot of interaction you can do with the world through these things. It's a super fun hobby. In many ways, it was kind of the very first uh, socially distant hobby where you know you're just chilling at home, uh, no one else in the room, and doing ham radio, talking with someone far, far away. Very pandemic friendly. There's been a lot more activity on the bands due to the pandemic. But uh, again, as with any hobby, you know, sometimes you have positive experiences with, with people in the hobby. Sometimes it's negative. I truly hope that everyone that does get into this hobby has far more positivity than negativity. Okay, last slide, I promise. Thanks so much for watching. Again, there's the link to GitHub. I'll post it in the Slack shortly. If you're interested in ham radio, check out the PancakesCon 2 talk that talks about doing the, more of these things with the ISS. It's super good. And uh, again, in the spirit of PancakesCon, hey, maybe consider burning your $300 free Google Cloud credit on a cyber range if you got it. Maybe spend some money on ham radios. Again, trying to keep this uh, as accessible as possible, not recommending like the thousands of dollars of gear that some people do on YouTube. You can hit me up anytime on InfoSec Exchange. Uh, I'll be in the Slack for quite a bit today. And have a happy, happy, happy PancakesCon. And uh, with that, uh, Emily, if you're there, do we got time for live Q&A or should we just go straight to the Slack channel? We have time for Q&A. There has been a awesome. lot of chatter in Slack. I okay. haven't uh, seen any questions that were directed. There we go. There's a question for you. Um, what do you think is the biggest benefit from upgrading to general? Ooh, I love that question. So I think the biggest benefit is if you're getting, if let's say you're on 10 meters and you're getting this type of environment where you're transmitting and you're hitting like one person nearby. If you have a general license, especially with the, the G90 radio I mentioned, you can actually press this tune button and go to a different band, like let's say 20 meters or 40 meters, and you might have much more success of that signal bouncing off the ionosphere. So instead of it looking like this, it might look like uh, this, if anything, way better. Like you might see instead of just hitting your local municipality, now you're hitting Japan from the middle of the US. It is just phenomenal 
what many of those bands that you can access with the general license can do when 10 meters are having a bad day. And especially if you want to play with radios at night, uh, 10 meter isn't the best at night here in the U.S. nowadays. Every once in a great while, it'll be like really good and you might even be able to hit Australia at night, but uh, that, that's kind of hit or miss. If you get the general license, you have to study a whole lot more, but you can access a whole lot more radio wave spectrum to have a whole lot more fun. Super, thank you. And I actually had a question uh, about the cyber range portion. Um, what What's the coolest thing you, you've you done with it once you got it built? Ooh, oh, that's a trick, tricky one. I, I think my favorite was, I was really struggling with, um, you know how like if you go into a hotel, and like uh, you, you hop on the Wi-Fi and it makes you register like, you know, your room number or whatever. Well, I was trying to do that, but for a, a wired test bed network, I was having all kinds of issues with it. But because I had that set up in the cyber range, I had my uh, wired switch that was doing all the authentication traffic, doing the captive portal where like I'd go to some website, I'd get redirected and I'd try to log in and, you know, do like the self-registration. And I got it working. And the coolest thing was when all the authentication server traffic, that, so the authentication servers were in Google Cloud. Obviously, the network equipment I was you know, playing with was at my home. And there was a feature where I actually got a text message of, hey, this is your authentication code to log into this network. And that text message was going from my home to Google Cloud back to my home again, because that's where I had the web proxy set up, and then off into whatever that SMS relay service was, so that I could get my, you know, fake, um, you know, zero trust test environment where I wanted to do that captive portal for everything working. Just like the amount of, uh, you know, back and forth hair pinning between all these different things and the fact that it actually worked was just super cool for me. I know I'm kind of more of a, a network authentication nerd, so... Maybe that's not the best example, but you can do some real powerful stuff with those virtual machines. It's what you found cool, and that's what I wanted to hear about. So thank you. Um, one last one to close it out before we shut things down. Uh, do the SDRs you mentioned require running big or long antennas outside? So it depends on what type of radio waves you're trying to receive. If you're trying to get the stuff like uh, the ADSB signal, that that's like, I think, one point something gigahertz. So uh, a teeny tiny antenna, preferably next to a window or outside, that'll do you a lot of good. If you're trying to get more of like the AM shortwave channels or, or some of these bigger ham radio uh, HF waves, that's where either having like a long wire, like if you can run just a plain old wire on the top of a roof or something, you know, have it be very long because these radio, radio waves are quite big. And there's all types of different tools you can do to uh, kind of tune up some of these wires and really improve the the ability to receive uh, different signals into the SDR. But uh, I've had a lot of success just messing around with my SDRs with just having this little, you know, um, suction cup type mount antenna for, for some of the higher frequencies. And then just having, uh, in my old condo, I actually had like a, a plain old electrical wire going up and down uh, the side of the balcony going into the SDR. And I was picking up some pretty strong signals from there. It was uh, pretty reliably from this tiny little balcony in, in Chicago. I was able to get signal from the Caribbean. I think the furthest away I ever heard was probably something in South America. But um, yeah, with a little bit of time and effort, you can really fine tune those cheap SDRs. Excellent.